Value Tainers, every once in a while I get interviewed by somebody that runs their own podcast or YouTube channel that asks questions that have not been asked before, which leads to answers and topics that we haven't spoken about before, and I get compelled to want to share it with you, and that's exactly what happened with Petros when he interviewed me. He has his own YouTube channel. He runs a business, owns 700 gyms, very successful entrepreneur out of California, and I think you're going to take a lot away from this video today. Again, multi-dimensional type of a conversation that I think you will appreciate. Hey friends, Bedros Koulian here. Welcome to another great episode of the Empire Podcast Show, Inside Look. Today we have a very amazing friend, someone that I look up to, learn from, and of course get entertained by Mr. Patrick but David, founder and CEO of PHP Agency and Valuetainment, an amazing show that I'm hooked on. Pat, welcome to the Empire Podcast. Thanks for having me, bud. Yes, sir. First and foremost, I got to tell you, I got to, your interviews of people that, well, mob bosses and people that infiltrated the mob had me so fascinated that I went back and watched Donnie Brasco and all those movies again because I'm such a big fan of that era. I do have a question for you where Tell that me. is concerned. If we lived in a different time, maybe if we went back, let's say, 40, 50 years, would Patrick had been a gangster? I think if a Michael Francis was a father figure type, Probably, and I would have probably done a pretty good job at it. Fascinating. Yeah. If I had a father figure like a Michael or a Sonny or one of those guys, most likely. Gotcha. Do you think you think like a gangster at times? You have to. You, uh, there's no question about it. In the business world? Sure. Oh, you have to think that way. Interesting. Oh, you have to, especially uh, in the world of, look, we're, we're, we're friends, we're compelled, you know, we may talk here, but within your world, the bigger you get, there's a lot of people that are not happy about your brand getting bigger. Sure. You open up more gyms, this is not exciting to a lot of other people that own gyms. It's not even exciting to somebody that runs a different model when it comes down to franchising. Right. So you're not helping people, it's helping competitors. You're hurting them. True. And when it comes down to it, if it's between your five locations versus my five locations, they are going to be competitive. So you get in the world of business being very, everybody wants to help, everybody's this, and then you realize there's a part of it that some of the people would take their side over you any day. All right, now I think the bottom line here as we start off the show is that uh, entrepreneurship is a lot like being a gangsta. It is. All right. It is, <laughs> minus the killing and all the other stuff, so. Right, right. Well, we're killing spirits sometimes, and, and that's, there's a lot of truth to that. We do, part of good marketing, I believe, is killing the spirit and the will of your competitor to thrive. Uh, and I think all great entrepreneurs must do that. It's just my own personal viewpoint on it. Um, so let's start off here before we get into value tainment and php i'm very fascinated about your journey because like me you're an immigrant to the united states i was six when i came to the united states you were 10. what catapulted the move to the united states what catapulted the move from iran uh, from iran to come yes, here? well uh, um, my uh, father my mother would go back and my father would say let's wait till we get the green card before we go to germany and then when the war happened between iran and iraq and then khomeini died June 3rd, 89, my mother said, we got to get out of here. So six weeks later, we escaped. We went to Germany, lived there for about a year and a half at a refugee camp, and then we came out here November 28, 1990. So we had to get out. My parents didn't want me to serve the military over there. And uh, once I hit 12, I can't leave for no reason in Iran. Really? At that time. Yeah, so they wanted to get me out before I hit the age 12 so we can, uh, you know, not get caught up being there till 20, 22 years old. Obviously, I came over here and I served the U.S. Army which was kind of wild. My mother was in Iran, and uh, she got at a point where she ran out of money in the States, and uh, we were a welfare family at that time. My mother went to Iran, and she said, you have one or two choices. You can come back with me to Iran, or you can stay here and figure it out. I said, I'm staying here. I stayed here four weeks later. I went to South Carolina, Fort Jackson, Kentucky, started the Army. Why? Called her up. I said, I'm in the Army. Why, why join the Army? Why at that time? So I'll give you uh, the, the logical and the emotional. Logical. Uh, a guy named Jesus Guerrera kept following up with me since 14 years old. Okay, I wasn't a good kid in school. I was a troublemaker, 1.8 GPA. So he kept coming saying, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. What are you going to do? He kept saying, you ought to consider the army, all these other things. So one day, uh, I'm living with my sister for a month. The following morning, we party till 4 o'clock in the morning at her apartment at 17550 Burbank Boulevard in Encino. And in the morning, her boss came, you know, her, uh, uh, what do you call a landlord came to her saying, listen, you guys party too hard last night. You know, there's uh, uh, bottles of tequila and vodka all over the jacuzzi. This is an apartment complex. You cannot be doing this. 
And so she was getting evicted. She told me, you got to do something. In the morning, I woke up. They stole my Toyota Corolla 1983. Oh. Called my dad. I said, Dad, take me to the recruiting station. Went to the recruiting station, signed up. That was it. Instant decision. Like, there wasn't any, let me think about it. The car is stolen. I'm sitting at the balcony. I'm looking outside. I come inside. I call my dad. Take me to Glendale. Text me to Glendale. I tell the guy, if you can get me in the Army tomorrow, I'm signing up. He says, it's three months. I said, I'm not signing up. They make a few calls. They get the orders from MEP station. Come back two weeks later, I'm in South Carolina. Why, if you can get me in the Army tomorrow and not wait three months? I, I, I am a guy that when I make a decision, I make a decision. Have so you always been decisive? I would say I've always been pretty decisive. Once, once I make the decision. So for me, what has happened with maturity is I am now calculating a lot more uh, uh, reason and consequences of the decision. Because back then, I only had to think about one person as a decision goal. Today, I have to think about my employees, my investors, my family, my wife, my kids, the crusade, the cause, the vision, long term, short term. I have to think about all those things. So the decision may take a little longer, but once I make it, I'm moving on. Gotcha. That's fascinating. That's fa so you're in the 101st? Airborne. Airborne. Yeah. Gotcha. And uh, so you get out of the military. How old are you at this point? Uh, I'm about to turn 21, June of uh, 1999. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward just for a second to today. Like today, you've got this amazing YouTube channel, Valuetainment, which truly, when I say like this man entertains me, guys and gals, like... My wife and I'm like, honey, you got to watch this. Like, this is the guy, Joe, Joe Piscone. Joe Pistone. Pistone uh, from Donnie Brasco. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the guy, and, and Pat's interviewing him. Your interviews are so unique and different. For me as an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter who you're interviewing, whether it's athletes or uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Um, Jordan Belfort. Jordan Belford, or any kind of former gangster, FBI agent, doesn't matter. I can take something to apply to my life or my business. Mm -hmm. So it's entertaining, and I can extract value, hence valuetainment. You named it appropriately. You're, this is obviously seems like your passion project, and you financially do very well in life that you're able to do your passion project. Where did this passion project come from? So um, if you go back in high school, if you hung out, if you and I hung out together, I told stories, I pulled pranks, uh, I was uh, uh, the jokester, but uh, the guy that would bring people together, and I was curious, I want to know sto your story, I want to know about your parents how your parents met. I was always curious, like even when we're upstairs, I'm asking you questions. Yeah. I want to know your upbringing, older sister, older brother, six years old when you came out here, 700 stores, $67, $9.97. I'm looking at everything you're telling me, your age, you know, you talk about your wife, the two pictures there. I'm curious. Here's a story of a guy who's got a strong father, who was a card member of communism because he had no choice, comes to the States, tells you there's no way in the world you have you're going to turn out to be nobody. We didn't come here for you to be anybody. That's that expectation. You turn out to be who you are today. I'm always fascinated by stories, right? So for me, when I came out of the military, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. And then, you know, I hung out with bodybuilders. I realized it's way too much on the body and on the logical side. Six, three and a half, six, four bodybuilding today. You got to be 330 to compete. I don't want to carry 330 pounds on this body frame and you know, go with that. That's too much pressure on the heart. So I made that decision, distinction. I'm not going to go that route. And then all of a sudden, I met a girl and got into the financial services. That was purely accidental. I was never going to sell stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. So this so point in your late 20s when you is meet this girl? 21 years old. Okay. I meet this girl at Venice Beach, California. B, I think we were together, by the way, when I met her. I met her at Venice Beach, California. And then she's working at Morgan Stanley. We start going out. She picks me up in a different car every time. I said, how did you make your money? She said, I work at Morgan Stanley. What do you do? I'm a stockbroker. How did you get your job? I got a degree from UCLA. You need it. They won't hire you. And that's when I send the resumes out. Back then, we used to send resumes out. So my resume had Bob's Big Boy, Burger King, Hagen Dazs, you know, Bally's, and military. That was sure. it. So I sent a resume with a joke on a cover letter, and I told them, I said, listen, you know, if you laugh after reading this joke, this is exactly how my customer is going to feel doing business with me. They're going to love me. If you want somebody like this part of your team, give me a call. So I sent 100 of them. I got 30 calls, 15 interviews, three offers. I took one of them with Morgan Stanley uh, Glendale. And so this industry of financial services was never intentional. I've always been a math guy. If I had it my way, I would have probably gone to entertainment. That was my next question. Yeah, so that's the part. So I would have gone in that route, but... Entertainment. Entertainment. As yeah. in managing or agency or, uh, or actually as being in, in front of the camera? As in uh, front, behind, storytelling, directing. You know, I'm the guy that for me, therapy is going to movies by myself at 10 o'clock in the morning. That explains a lot about that's value therapy. Payment. Yeah, sure. so I go to movies and I'm sitting by myself and I'll see the movie like somebody will come back and they'll say, 
you know, I Am Legend, what a terrible movie. I said, you didn't see the movie. He said, I'm telling you, I saw the movie. I said, you did not see the movie. So you got to go watch a movie with me. Then you go watch a movie. And I said, look at this angle. Boom, look at this. You see what happened right there? That's what this is explaining. This part's about this. Look at this. I never caught. Do you see that poster in the back? That's what the poster, the director's trying to tell you, look at that. You missed it. Look at this part. Sometimes we don't catch those additional messages that we need to get, right? The storytelling part. I'm fascinated about that. So I realize today the world we're living in. If you don't tell the world who you are, if you don't tell the camera the world who you are, the world's going to tell the world who you are. Mm. So you have two choices. So a lot of people that say, well, I'm a private guy. No problem. Stay private. Let the world tell everybody who you are. Or you can get in front of the camera and say, this is who I am. So you're saying control the narrative. You have to because if you don't, no one really knows who you are. See, I can watch a couple videos of you. And you pop up and you comment on Instagram. And I go up and I say, let me see this guy. And I say, wow, this guy communicates very well. Petros, that's an Armenian name. Is he Yerevan? Is he Parska? Is he Beirutai? What, what is this guy? Where is he from? How did he make his money? And then now I come to a place. I see this location that you have. Beautiful, very detailed. July 22nd, baby, you are. So you're, you're one of these perfectionist guys. Structure, organized. You got everything situated. So then I'm intrigued by you. But say you don't do that. I don't know who you are. Mm. All I'm going to take is those three people that I used to work with who didn't like you, they'll say, you never want to work with Petros. Let me tell you who he really is. Then they have more influence than these guys. Gotcha. So you have to control the narrative. That is a great lesson to take away here. That's not a marketing lesson. That's not just a life lesson. That is an overall lesson in how to create your legacy. Control the narrative. So you were supposed to be... <laughs> is there any aspiration in, in going into entertainment, film still now? Or are you so far into the financial world? No, that I put life as 20, 20, 20, okay? So here's what 20, first 20 is just trying to figure life out and survive, right? Like I have no idea what I wanna do. I'm, I'm, I have to make it out of 20 without committing a massive crime, going to prison or doing anything dumb. The big dumb mistakes you make in your first 20, I was lucky enough to graduate without making that. Hey, what was your dumbest mistake in your first 20? You tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. I mean, I, it, well, it was association was my biggest part because I was so fascinated with, you know, authority at a hard time with authority, right? So it was like, hey, you're telling me what to do. You know, I'd get caught doing some stuff. We're in Vegas one time, me and my uh, uh, four guys from Bur Burbank Torres and we're driving down and New York guys pulls up. Hey, where are you from? Where are you from? New York. And my dad and Albert are staying at the hotel. These guys take out a gun. We take out a gun. We go at it. We're running the streets. Cops are chasing wait, us. Wait, wait, wait. Guns actually shot? Like oh, guns I'm 14 years old. Get oh. the fuck out I'm of here. 14 years Are old. you serious? Oh, no doubt about it. So I run out that night, and I went up. I'm shaking when I see my dad. Cops are coming. He, they catch us. It's done. You don't know who PBD is because financial services felony. I can't be in a financial services. So I go upstairs to Tropicana. I knock on the door. My dad comes up. Why are you shaking? No, nothing, nothing. So why are you so nervous? Like, what happened? No, nothing happened. So, why, are you, why are you sweating? Why are you, come inside. So I go inside. We sit there. Everybody's, we're just waiting. They're going to knock on the door. And nothing happened. Did you ever tell your dad? Of course I told my dad. <laughs> but I, my, I, that night or years no, later? No, no, no. Years no later. way. No. My dad and my mom had a divorce. And if he, you know, if this story got out that under my dad's watch that I see him once every other week. Oh, I see. This happened. I would never see my best friend in the world. So I'm not throwing him under the bus. There's no way in the world. So mom's going to say, look what you can't even control your 14-year-old kid who goes out. So that's just one of many. There's a lot of dumb stories. What's yours? Holy smokes. Oh, well, my, mine was, there was no guns involved, but I, I was part of a home invasion robbery. And um, I was the getaway driver. I was the getaway, getaway. So three of my friends enter a home that they think is empty. Turns out the little old lady is there. And so instead of just a rob and dash, it ends up in home invasion is what the cops call it because, well, the lady sees them. They come running out. And I'm thinking, did you guys get everything that quick? Drive. And I drive and I see a helicopter. So it's a police helicopter chase. Uh, Brookhurst and La Palma is where I end up getting, you know, unmarked cars, police helicopter, pull over. All right, fellas, run. As soon as we get out of the car, no one's running. I mean, we just dogpile us. And I had a boot on the back of my neck. They bring the little old lady. They, they, she's inside of a parked police car. We're sitting on the hood of a car, the four of us, those three guys who were in the house and me, the driver. And uh, she points out, yes, I saw his face, his face, his face, but she couldn't ID me because I was the driver. Wow. I was never in the house. That was a turning corner for me that I will never break the How law again. How old were you at that time? 18. 18. I just turned 18. Wow. Yeah. So that could have been something very permanent. Like, it's not a minor anymore. Now I'm an adult, right? So that could have been a very permanent scar on me. So I'm very grateful that that never went further. Well, if you, the old lady's watching, thank you so much for doing that. He's created a lot of jobs, just so you know. The economy's doing better. 
because of this man here. Yeah, if I, if I could go back, I would, I would apologize. Yeah, I'm sure she's long gone by now. God bless her. So, all right, so there you are now, through the grace of this young woman that you're dating and who shows up with many different cars, were you impressed by the cars, by the money? What was money to you? Because obviously you're like, whoa, okay, she's making money. Money is a vehicle to what for you? Yeah, so again, we're in Glendale. You and I went to junior high school to get, I went to Wilson Junior High School and then Glendale High School. So from Wilson Junior High, we would drive down Verdugo, okay? And it was an under the bridge, you would drive down. Uh, we would walk down all the way down and I lived on Broadway and Verdugo right across from, there's a, a, a you know, post office here, Glendale High School is here, I'm right here, Broadway, okay? 1323 Broadway is where I live. That drive, I had a friend named Adrian. He would tell me, okay, Pat, tell me a story today. So I'd say, listen, would you rather be a millionaire? The best, you know, the richest man in the world, the best baseball player in the world, the biggest rock star, the best Hollywood actor, which one would you want to be? And we would talk about it, right? These kind of, oh my gosh, if I'm baseball, I got that time Barry Bonds, maybe I'm a McGuire. You know, what if I'm Brad Pitt? What if I'm Warren Buffett or Bill Gates? Or what if I'm, you know, the rock star performing, 100,000, who would you want to be, right? So to me, it was all about the dream. You know, when you, that song goes, it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Yep. I mean, it literally was all about the dream, okay? Parents get a divorce. I had one uncle who lived on Upland off of San Antonio. I don't know if you know that area, like Snoop has a house up there. So we go to his house once a year. And every time I go to his house, it was a 7,200 square foot house. You'd go in. He always had a Jaguar. He was a Jaguar guy. You know, he had a, a, a bird collection here, putting here. You'd go in. Like a putting green? Putting green, yeah, yeah to the right. Kitchen where they would always hang out to get and make breakfast. His office was here one time. He took me to his bedroom. You'd go up the stairs. There was a jacuzzi up there for he and his wife. Then the living room was right here. He had a pool table with a picture of Al Gore. Obviously, it was on the, uh, the left politically. And every time I was there, he would sit and his kids would come and they would debate. And he would say, he's a Christian guy, he would say, let me tell you, I saw an argument the other day. I want to hear what you guys are going to say. Here's an argument. God doesn't exist because of that, 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 that. If he did this, bah, 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 bah. if God is predetermined and everything God knows what's going to happen next, then why do we make bad decisions? Maybe I didn't make the bad decision. Maybe God made the bad decision. And I would see this guy just asking all these questions. These kids, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. That argument is this. So tell me about the sports team that won. Why did this happen? This man named Luther Lazar in back, backyard, tennis court, swimming pool, changing room, flowers, watermelon. He would, you know, plant stuff. And I would see him walk around, his kids, grandkids loved him, family, they were all together. That was the only element of dream I had in my life. The only thing, the only glimpse that I said, what if, right? So for me, when I saw this girl and I said, look, anything to get out. Bodybuilding, there's not a lot of money in. I was working at Bally Toyota Fitness. I heard you briefly say LA Fitness. I don't know if you ever did with anything with Bally's and Anaheim. But uh, uh, Bally Toyota Fitness, so for me, that was the way I got into it. And uh, if this was my route, I always like math. And I said, if I can get in and they give me an opportunity, I'm going to make it work. So that's kind of how it happened. Holy smokes. Moving forward then. So you decide, all right, I'm going to go. Was it Morgan Stanley? Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley. How do you cut your teeth? Because from what I've heard, and you tell me if I'm right, you don't even start selling until months later. Is that true? Well, in an you, organization like that? Yeah. You, so it depends on how you get recruited. If you get recruited on intern, you're not selling for three years. So you're going in, you're not even taking your Series 7 for three years later, right? You go in, I work under you, I do assistant stuff for you, then three years later you give me the green light, then I go take my 7 after I got my bachelor's degree from whoever, right? And I kind of work in yeah. that way. They, I got a position, is what they did. They gave me a position, okay? And so when I got the position, day one they submitted my U4, U4 is what you submit to take your Series 7 exam, I took my 766, if you fail your Series 7 the first time, you're done. One shot. You fail the first time. So I got started with Morgan Stanley Dean Witter a day before 9-11, 2001, Monday. The next day, 9-11 happens, 3,700 employees at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter World Trade Center is gone. Oof. So our training went from uh, World Trade Center to Mark Hopkins, San Francisco, complete different side. But uh, yeah, so that's how you get your 7. If you, if you fail it, you're out, you're gone. And then at that time, Morgan had a minimum of $12 million you need to bring in your first year. You don't bring 12 mil, you go on probation, then you're out. Gotcha. All right, so at some point you decide, hey, I don't think I'm going to work for someone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat my own path. Why do you even decide to do this? It sounds like you were making, doing pretty well. Yeah, at Morgan, no. I, I, I didn't get a taste of money at Morgan. I got a little bit of taste of money prior to Morgan making 10 or 20 grand in a month one time, but never really like a taste, taste of money. 
And so from Morgan, I, at that time, my girlfriend at the time was an assistant to a guy who owned a windows company, a guy named Aaron. And he was a guy I always admired. He was a New York guy that flew him from New York, came to L.A., but he made his money in New York. Rough around the edges, 5'3", on a good day, perfect nails, flawless, eyebrows like plucked, like I'm talking like perfection, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you know, the ones that you do. He would just come in and the way he would walk, he'd be very particular about shaking people's hands. One of those guys, just try to visualize this guy here, yeah, yeah. that's who he was. But he was very good in business. He's such a good storyteller. So I'm sitting with him and I said, hey, you know, I would tell my girlfriend, you got to give me one-on-one -on -one time with him. So I go sit with him and says, listen, your girlfriend keeps telling me you're going to be a millionaire one day. I said, yeah. I said, look at this business card. I'd like to earn your business. I give my business card, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. I said, I'm working with the best. He says, really? He said, yes. I said, yes. So I sit down. He starts laughing at me. I said, why are you laughing? He says, rule number one of creating wealth. I said, what's that? Never, ever work for a sexy established company. Never. I said, why? He said, if you work for a sexy established company, no one knows you. If you quit, you get fired. You're just another employee ID. Go to a company, help it become sexy, established, be a leader, own a piece, you'll become wealthy. I left. Hmm. Went to another company, Transamerica. I was there with them for about seven and a half years. And in October 20th of 2009, uh, just said we're going to leave and start PHP agency. No kidding. Yeah, started a company. So PHP started in 2009. October of 2009. September 23rd, I resigned. October 20th, we became official. October 28th, the company I was a part of uh, filed a lawsuit, 400-page lawsuit. It's a $400 billion company. They sued us. It's the only time I've ever been sued in my life. Filed a lawsuit. And that I went from having some savings that I saved in my 20s, depleted all the way down to $13,000, and uh, no one knew about it. Wow. I was playing poker, acting as if I got a million behind me. I only had $13,000. No kidding. Never missed payroll, never missed commission, never missed anything. And it was a very dirty... This is part of the mafia thing that came in. I was the guy that was... A nice, naive guy coming out, coming up, and it was cool. Now, obviously, I saw a lot of stuff in the streets, but I was optimistic about everybody's going to want to try to do good to you. And then you get into business, and you see different side, and then you become a competitor. And a lot of people that were friends, all of a sudden, they're looking at you as an enemy. Sure. So you see a different part of the game. So that, that, that How do you feel about that? When, when people you came up with then see you as the enemy? I'm very comfortable with that. Look, my parents got a divorce. Bogosian be David, okay? Bogosians were Armenians, but Davids were Assyrians, right? Bogosians believed in communism, uh, but Davids believed in imperialism, okay? Now, you got to realize that, by the way, they believed in communism, so they were not card members because they had to. Right. They were card members because they chose to, sure. okay? So in Iran, there was a crew called Today, and Today was like the communistic, you know, underground project in Iran. So when my parents got a divorce, if I hung out with my dad's uh, family, his brothers would say, look at him. You know, he's a Borosian, he's Armenian, he wants to hang out with them. And those sarcastic comments, right, I've never liked them. And when I was with the Borosian family, they would say, look at him, he's like his dad. He likes a Syrian. He's, look what he's doing, he's trying to be like his dad, he's this. So they would both say, so I was eight, nine years old, I sat my uncles down and I saw my uh, mother's family down. I said, let me explain guys something very simple here. There's only three people in my life that matter. My mom, my dad, my sister, you don't matter to me. I am simply good to you because you're my, brother, my, my father's brothers. Outside of that, you're irrelevant to me. You're my, saying this at the age of eight or nine? Eight or nine years old to my family. How do you even have the wherewithal, the, the, the emotional wherewithal to say this to an adult? And in that culture, because that's the culture I come yeah, from, so, you're supposed to look up to them. You're supposed and to. And I do. I love them. You have to realize that these people are, are uh, very good to me. I mean, my mother's brother is who brought caviar to me. He'd come at 2 o'clock in the morning right. after the party, and he'd wake me up. We'd sit there, hey, don't tell your mom I'm doing this. Let's wake up. We'd eat spoons of caviar together in Bandar Pahlavi, which is, you know, Caspian Sea. It's the best kind of caviar. And Johnny and, 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 and uh, these guys over here, Victor, they were very good to me. They were nice to me. But they played the game of pinning. They played the game of pinning, and I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of that because I am here because I am Armenian proudly, and I am a Syrian proudly. I'm Armenian and a Syrian, born in Iran and American. I'm proud to be Iranian, Armenian, Assyrian, and American. That's this blood. That's this product. All of it's combined into being what it is. So I was used to that manipulative games when my parents got a divorce. Mm. And so when it happened, it was just purely flashbacks. I get it. I fully understand. But here's what I also know. You can think whatever you want right now. In the next 10 years, you're going to love to be friends with me. And you will call me. I won't call you. And it's exactly what happened. So the level of patience to say to yourself, if I'm staying true 
on the way I treat you, your family, peers, people call me, ask about competitors. If I stay true to my game and everybody knows I'm predictable in the way I speak about everybody in the marketplace, eventually people are going to know who you really are. Color, you know, your true colors are eventually going to come out. Amen. So, would you say you had a chip on your shoulder, Pat? Till today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Till today. I try to fix it so it doesn't come out every once in a while. But, you know, it still comes out. And, and there's a lot of it. You know, it's. What do you say to people who say, you know, hey, do something about that? You, you're successful now. You don't have to have that I chip. I don't mind it at all. Do you I, want it there? I, I don't. I am very comfortable at being there. Matter of fact, listen, I got three kids. I got a six year old, five year old, two year old, right? I don't mind my kids having a little bit of a chip. So, my raising up my kids isn't the environment of don't fight in front of your kids, don't show conflict in front of your kids, let them not see. I don't come from that school of thought. I don't. I come from the school of thought that they have to see. Now they're living with a father who's got a lot of money, successful, whatever. You know, you're always going to nice places. Everybody's always wanting to take care of you because your daddy's this. And, you know, but let's just say Mario is tough on my son. He, I will never go to Mario and say, Mario, don't talk to my son like that at all. If my son acts up with you, and you try to discipline him, say we're friends, you will never hear it from me. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, it's not going to come, hey, Petros, don't talk to my son like that. It does. That won't happen. You he believe needs in the tribe. It. He needs it, right? He needs that to push him a little bit. So, you know, I, I tried to find a way, like yesterday. I'll tell you what happened. I almost missed my flight to come to you, by the way, yesterday. And I'll tell you why. So yesterday, we, uh, um, I fly in. We were out doing a major project. Like, we were blowing stuff up, like with tanks, with blow, uh, what, do you, what was that thing called? Flamethrower. Uh, 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 flame oh, and we're doing fun. all this crazy. I mean, we were doing, you know, Sherman tanks and shooting up drones. Where was uh, this? Uh, this was in Texas, somewhere we found. Literally, we're we dealing with a guy move, that's guys. an 18-Charlie guy. You got to go to this place, drivetanks.com. Insane, okay? Insane. You would love this place. Yeah. So we come back. Haven't had a lot of sleep, but it's Sunday. I got to spend time with these kids. I spend time with them. We go out. We, we go to church, then we go to yard house, and we go to the house, then we go get a haircut to the two boys, which they like to get the haircut and the massage the whole night. So then we go to their school. They had a trick or treat. They're dressed as the Incredibles, right? So he's running on all this other stuff. And then my oldest, every time he gets upset, he says, no one loves me. Ah, da, 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 da. And he just wants to, you know, have this uh, idea. And he, he wrote this nice letter to his friend Lennox, okay? And he gets into the house. You're not giving this to me. You're not a good daddy. You're not this. He rips the letter that he drew to his best friend and he trashes it. I don't want anybody in my life. I said, go grab that thing right now. Go grab it right now. Sit down. I said, let me explain something to you. Look at me. Look at me right here. I don't want you to get distracted. Look at me. I said, number one. Rule number one. Do you love Lennox? Yes. Is he a good friend of yours? Yes. Who made you mad today? Me. It's not my fault. It's your fault that you got upset with me. But what does that have to do with Lennox? Here's a sheet of paper. I need you to sit down right here. The moment that you drew that thing and wrote that letter for Lennox, you need to still share that emotion with him. Draw it down right now. You're not taking a shower. He drew it again. I said, you're going to go give this thing to him because you cannot hold back an emotion like that to somebody you love just because somebody else pissed you off. So he's, I said, does that make sense to you? Yes, daddy. Draw it down. He draws it down. I said, who loves you? You love me, daddy. Perfect. It's going to be okay. But you can't cop out on situations like this. So we go at it. That friction is going to be there. And that's a six-year-old. It's a six-year-old. But he has to get that because you and I have the luxury of seeing a lot more yeah. uh, terrible things when we were growing up. Yeah. They don't have that luxury. We almost have to create it for them. Why do you think that's a luxury that we had, the hardships? You know, I was in the Army. I get out of the Army. People ask me, what's the biggest difference when you were in the Army and you got out? I, you have a different lens. I can't describe it. Like, listen, a, 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 a blind person cannot see what somebody with you know, vision can see, right? At the same time, Richard Turner, whom I interviewed, who's a number one card mechanic in the world, who's been blind since he was nine years old, because one day he's in school, he's reading a book, he can't see anything here. The only thing he can see is here. And this guy, all of a sudden, is fully blind. He becomes a number one card mechanic in the world. I said, what do you have that I don't have? He says, I feel everything you're doing. I feel the movements. I feel your eyebrows. I feel everything that's moving. I feel that left hand you just moved right now. I feel like that guy over there just moved. I feel he just picked up his leg. His pants just did this. The camera guy just put his arm down. That guy just did this. You don't have that luxury. You and I will never have that, right? We are right. never going to have that. The right. only reason he has a death, that's 20 years of experience of being blind. We have a certain experience of hell. When you experience hell, things slow down. You just kind of look around and everything slow. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to figure it out. It's going to be all right. That's not that big of a deal. It just happened. Game, relax, come back, let's strategize. Everything becomes slower. 
when you have experienced a lot of tragedy, right? Everything. And that chip allows you to say, that's, I don't know why we're afraid of this. Not a big deal. This person's not that intimidating. It's okay. We don't need to be afraid of this. Guys, we're going to be able to overcome this. It brings a certain level of poise, confidence to the crew that you're running with. You cannot go to a conference and gain that. You can only gain that from being in hell and back. And so if you haven't had that, you got to almost put yourself in certain situations to experience hell. If you don't put yourself in those types of situations, no conference in the world is ever, ever going to give that to you. Fascinating. Not at all. Fascinating. So who's your favorite, uh, who's a favorite personality that you've had on Valuetainment that you've interviewed? Who's your favorite personality? Well, first of all, Michael and I are very good friends now. We, uh, I invested into a business with he, he and I because of the show. Uh, he ended up getting a massive show in Vegas, which if you haven't seen Mob Story, if you go to Vegas, you got to watch Mob Story. He tells the story of Mob Story. He tells the story about Hoffa, about Marilyn Monroe, how Marilyn Monroe really died and who was behind it. He says Hoffa is underwater. I, I know he is. Do you yeah. believe this? Well, I mean, listen, I, I, there's a, I do believe the part that the mob had something to do with Kennedy because I've asked that from a lot of different people, and they have said yes. Because when he became president, the mob helped him a lot. Helped him a lot. And, you know, in Chicago, I interviewed uh, Abraham Bolden, who was mm -hmm. the first African-American Secret Service agent. He specifically said that 7,000 people in Chicago who voted for uh, uh, Kennedy were all dead. They were not alive. These are dead people that voted for him. So there was a lot of that stuff that happened that a mob helped out. Uh, I'd say Michael Francis' entertaining. Gloria Allred uh, was very tough. Uh, I respect somebody that's gone through hell and back and for her to be a firm believer, even though we agree. Tough to interview or she's a tough person? She's a tough person, Got period. 80% of the stuff we disagree with, but, you know, you can't ex explain what she went through in 1984 when she got raped in Mexico. From there, she decides to come out and become who she is. You are never going to change a person's mind like that. That's a life experience. That is not going to change. But Jordan Peterson was very entertaining. Uh, I can't really pick one or two. Mm. Truly, I enjoy every one of these things. That the ones that I like the most, you will know which ones I don't like if they're only less. If, le if, if it's less than forty minutes, I was really not enjoying myself. Gotcha. So okay. look at anything below forty, and I'm saying it. There are some interviews I did where I just went in there, Petros. Th these are arrogant, cocky, out of control. I'm like, here's Kevin Hart. The guy's got 150 million people. He has to be cocky, and he's not. And you're cocky for what? What are you being cocky for? Relax yourself. You know, you, you, you did something that's big, but it's not that, you know, so you can't pull information and want to talk to them. They're too much above everybody. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, if any interviews below 40, I didn't enjoy it. Any interview above an hour, I'm pretty much enjoying myself. Interesting. So in 2009, you build PHP. And this is an agency where it's financial services. Is it mainly financial services? Or Insurance and annuities. Insurance and annuities. Yep. How many employees do you have now? So we have 8,200 insurance agents in 49 states. We started off with 66. So 66 agents is now 8,200 in 49 states. Okay. In nine years. In nine years. De La Hoya is one of our investors. I cut a check to De La Hoya every month. Gabriel Brenner is an investor who is the first Mexican-born professional sports owner in America. And Adelaide Fund out of New York, which is a $2 billion fund. We have 60 employees that support 8,200 agents. 62 employees. 62 employees support, support 8,200 8, 200 agents. agents. Gotcha. Gotcha. In 49 states. 49 states. In 49 states. How often do you get a big group of these agents together to pump them up, motivate them, give them clarity on vision? So it used to be more before than now because if you think I tell the story well, you have to hear them tell the story. I mean, you, you would think these guys are the founders of the company when you hear them tell the story. I mean, I'm talking tears coming down. They're tugging at your heart. And, you know, they're, they're incredible at what they're doing. So now it's more I go out when needed. But for the most part, our guys are doing it. We do do one big conference every year, which we did in August. Is that and the one you had Kevin Hart at? That's the one I had Kevin Hart yeah. at. We had 5,000 people there in attendance. It was wild. I mean, it was, listen, it was absolutely as untraditional as a conference in the financial industry as it could be because Kevin Hart said the F word maybe 200 times. And our carriers are not used to this because right. it's a lot of good old boy, you know, sure. I went to the right school, I have the right last name, I went up the right way and so, oh my gosh, look what he's saying. You know, our average agent is a 34-year-old Hispanic female. Is what our, we're 51% women, 54% Hispanic, average agent is 34 years old. I'm curious, was this by structure or is this just how it turned out? Uh, 
It the was. age, the gender, the ethnicity. Yeah, so I like immigrants who are hard workers. That's what I like. I yeah. like immigrants who are hard workers. Oh, so you're an immigrant who's a hard worker. So that's what I like. Sure. I like an underdog. To you're me, like you and I would get along very well because yeah. you know what it is to pay the price. Then no one has to explain to you what time to get up, what time to work. You're going to get to work, sure. right? Th that's what I like. And then when it comes down to support team, I recruit April babies, my favorite kind, or April babies, uh, October babies, if they deal with people, February babies. I love those three when it comes down to support. When it comes down really? to field. Patrick, I gotta stop you. I've yeah. never heard anyone stand right there. We've had some amazing people there, yeah. from Tom Billiou to Jesse Itzler to you know it, using astrology to decide who's going into yeah. support and service. Explain this to me. So so I so because I ask so many questions, I'm a numbers guy, it stays with me. So you say July 22nd, in my brain I go and say, who's in July? Who's in July? Who's in July? And then I go boom, 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 boom. What is the level of consistency for 70% of them? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, got it. Let me ask him a question. Are you like this, 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 this? Yes. Okay, validation. So he's part of that community. You guys are wiring it a certain way. Now, by the way, for me, it's more months than it is astrology. So a lot of astrology, people don't like it when I say that because it's more months than I'm about, you know, July 22nd. I'm asked, I've missed it by one day, you know. Sure. I've, I, you know, so that part. So then for field, for field, like running the agency, I like June, I like July. Uh, I'm very comfortable when June and July when they deal with sales organization. But that's, you know, th those, now you got to realize, of course, there's an anomaly. I'm just telling you stuff sure. that I see that for me, it's like, okay, right. I'm comfortable with this. So October, February, April, home office, June, July, dealing with the field. Fascinating. So you're, you're quite the leader. You're quite the empire builder. And in such a short time, nine years is a very short run. And it's ironic that uh, you did it in such a short time. So the economy crashes and you decide that you're going to go into business and get sued at the same time. I mean, yes. you, didn't, you didn't decide to get sued, but th that was an outcome of you quitting and moving on. Going to, what do you do in times, because right now we're living in one of the best economies ever. The economy is great. Unemployment is as low as it's ever been. People have jobs. Everyone's buying everything. Yep. What is your mindset like in 2009 when the unemployment is 11.5% and the economy is not thriving? I mean, I am so looking forward to the next crash. Why? I'm telling you right now, I am... I am so enthusiastic about the next crash. But I, I hear everybody saying this right now, but Patrick, what are you, crazy? This I is how you make money so in good economies. I am so looking forward to the next crash. I can't even describe to you how much I'm oh, looking forward I to I love this. Please explain next, why. I will explain to you exactly why it is. When the crash happened, okay, wealth is not made in times like this. The people that are making real wealth today is because they were ready in 07. Not because they, uh, some of the people are making money. Oh my gosh, I turned seven thousand dollars into two hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars in Bitcoin. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a guy today who is preparing himself for the next twelve, twenty-four, you know, thirty-six, you know, four or five years. Crash is going to come around the corner. Every five years we have a small dip, but every ten years we've had a, a, a good, good-sized crash, and every twenty years it's pretty solid, right? When those happen, you will watch the market. In a market, you'll see, oh my gosh, she's scared. Did you see it? She flinched. Oh, I learned. Look at him. He's not going all in right now. Look at this guy right now. Look at that guy right now. They're playing defense. They're afraid. Did you see how he spoke the other day? They're very afraid. And you see some guy saying, boom, 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 because everything is on sale when a crash happens. Mm. Everything is on sale when a crash happens. When a mortgage, when mortgage was booming, if you went to LA, you know this, everybody, S500 was a pay con. Yep. And S500 was like a Ford Focus you're driving. Oh, you drive an S500, is everything good with you financially? You doing okay? Because it was 911, it was Ferrari, it was Lambo, it was Rolls Royce, it was Bentley, right? Every mortgage banker was making money, but it wasn't real money, it was fake money. Everybody owned a nice house based on Nina, no income, no asset. Everybody was getting financed at a one and a half million dollar home, refinance, make 200 grand, two and a half million dollar home, three million dollar home. Everybody was rich in, you know, 2000 to 2006. And in November of 07, it switched, right? And a bunch of people started shutting down. And some people said, well, I'm going to stay in because I'm in the long call and all this other stuff. Well, they lost a lot of the money and then they started doing REO, all these other things, right? Right now, Something's going to happen in the next five years. And the people that are going to make massive wealth are the ones that save cash. So I'm a cash guy. Not, not always. I'm a cash guy pre-crisis. You're a cash guy pre-crisis. Pre-crisis. Which is, which is now. Which is now. Which is now. So right now is a great time to have a lot of cash. Because what would you do with that cash if tomorrow morning you wake up and the economy A Mickey Mantle card, PSA 8, 
sells for one and a half million dollars today. A Mickey Mantle rookie card. When the crash happens, that Mickey Mantle card is going to sell for three, four hundred thousand dollars. You keep that Mickey Mantle card, ten years later that Mickey Mantle card is going to sell for three point five million dollars. A Mickey Mantle PSA 10 1952 tops just sold for twelve million dollars. Holy smoke. A Mickey Mantle card. Artwork from Picasso. All of these things that people don't know how to buy. These are all things that are a million dollars, three million dollars. When crisis happened, they bought it because the market was doing good. You go to the people that bought all those fancy stuff when the market was doing good, and you buy it at a tenth of a price. You sit on it for 10 years. You made 10x, 20x. This is a perfect time to be sitting on a lot of cash. Mm. Um, I sat with a guy who, who was the grandmaster of backgammon, uh, Victor Ashkenazi. I think you and him would do very, very good together. Uh, and he, he was a former Goldman guy for 11 years. He was a market maker, 40 million trades on a daily basis. And three days before the market crashed, he said, I said, how do you feel about the market? Uh, I think my opinion, I think we're about to experience a ma massive crash. I interview him three days later, the market tanks. Interest rates are going to go up. They don't like the uh, uh, current president. Whoever controls rates, rates go up. You know, the, the uh, market goes down. The issue with China right now, uh, midterms, there's a lot of manipulation that's going to be taking place. And so you got to be careful on what's going on with the people that are the decision makers behind the president, not necessarily the president, but the people that control Fed, all these other things, and they don't like them. So they can poke at anything. You just have to be ready, cash-wise, and it's about to happen. Gotcha. I love that. Guys, there, there's such a lesson in this. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this on a podcast, there's so many deep layers of lessons in here for the entrepreneur who's new, who's seasoned, and who's ready to strike. I had the good fortune, Pat, in 2000, late 2007, 2008, as the economy crashed, as you can imagine, I'm coaching and consulting personal trainers, gym owners. And well, all of a sudden they stop getting clients because people start losing money. They don't want to get a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer, which means one-on-one -on -one personal trainers stop working with me. I had to do an instant pivot. I turned the outdoor boot camp model into an indoor model and franchised it within the next two years. And that's how Fit Body Bootcamp came to be. And so every time I look at an economy crash, People says, well, the money went away. My mindset is the money just exchanged hands and I just need to know whose hands it went into and what offer I can make that person. And so I love how you explained this, that you've got to be sitting on cash right now because opportunities are gonna come, whether it's a Picasso painting, whether it's a Mickey Mantle card, whether it's a, someone who's got a competing business that's gonna sell it to you at wholesale. Brilliant model. So what is the future for Patrick but David through, through this agency, with the agency? and also with value attainment. Like what is the big outcome you're trying to achieve in the next five years? So a PHB agency, it's, it's very simple. We have grown now 14 quarters in a row. We have sold more insurance policies than the prior quarter, 14 quarters in a row. We've been up like two years ago, we were selling 500 policies a month. Two months ago, we sold 4,773 insurance policies in one month. Holy smokes. So from 500 to, to 4,773 policies. So we've grown three years in a row at a worst case scenario, 75%. There's been some years that was higher. Worst case scenario, we've grown at a 75%. That's three years in a row. So that part's growing and it's expanding. It's going in a very nice uh, place right now. We just made a biggest investment into technology, multi seven figures we invested into this technology that's going to condense time frames of processing from 15 minutes to two minutes to catching things that we need to catch and quality, everything's gonna get better. So we're excited about this technology we're creating. This one's growing, okay? And, and the part of the insurance industry today is most of the insurance companies, the carriers, the big companies, they're, they tried selling policies career side. Career side is if you work for New York Life, I'm New York Life, your career. Got it. If you work for Northwestern Mutual, your career, right? If you sell for AIG, Nationwide, XYZ, you're independent, okay? A lot of the insurance companies banked on career for many years, they fired their career. So once they fired their career, they had to rely on what? Because they thought, I'm gonna go into the internet and I'm gonna sell insurance on the internet. Here's what happened with internet. Nobody in the right mind buys life insurance on the internet, nobody. Nobody wakes up and says, honey, let's go buy life insurance today on Why the internet. That? Because insurance has to be sold, not bought. It's a different buy. Interesting. You buy a shirt. I like that jacket. Let me go buy it. I like that gym. Let's go check it out. I like CrossFit. Let me go see this. I like this. Let me go get it. No one sees an insurance commercial and let's go buy it, right? Sure. So someone has to come to you for you to get the, the willingness to want to buy a policy. So internet, once Google realized how much money these insurance companies are making, 
The most expensive word on Google today is insurance. It's $53 per click. So if you go on Google and you type in most expensive word on Google, it's going to come up with all the words mortgage bank. Number one is insurance. It's a real nice pie chart to actually see visually. So they realize internet's going to be too expensive for them to sell insurance on the internet. So now it becomes distribution. When you look at distribution, for the most part, it's taken. Farmers has their own, but you can't sell them. Farmers are only going to sell farmers. You know, you got Trans has their own. WFG has their own. Primerica has their own. You know, uh, New York has their own. Northwestern has their own. So most of these guys are taken. We are not taken. We are still in a place where a carrier can say, we need distribution. These guys have 8,200. They're young. They're going to go for a long time. We need to do something about it to lock us in. So that part's growing. That's PHP. Value tainment side, we're about to cross a million subs when we said we're going to cross a million subs. We're going to do a two and a half day conference for entrepreneurs. We'll be launching that very soon. Um, and that's going to be exciting once we do that. It's going to be, you know, A to Z, how to think, how to decide, how to process, hiring, firing, you know, how to raise money. It's going to be very technical. It's not going to be, you know, how sometimes you go to conferences, you can buy my package for this. You can buy my package for this. You can, and everybody's just selling their packages. Yeah. This is not that. You're it's not, not a, paying, it's not a pitch fest. Not at all. At all. You're going to have a handbook and we're processing each issue on how for you to level up leaving with the community of value tainers to help you grow your business to the next level. So people are going to come from all over the world to help entrepreneurs expand. And this value tainment community is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So with that part to me, I'm committed to spreading the concept of capitalism around the world. That's going to continue. I think if we want to really minimize unemployment, crime, a lot of these other things, if we increase entrepreneurs, a lot sure. of those things will go lower. So that's going to continue. As far as the entertainment, entertainment story stuff, we got some special cool things coming up soon as well. Gotcha. Fantastic. So before we wrap up, obviously you're, you're, you're one hell of a leader. You're a great entrepreneur, marketer, forward thinker. And if there was a young man or young woman who is an emerging entrepreneur, and you're only going to see them one time, and there's two, three, four pieces of advice by way of being an entrepreneur that you could impart with them, what would those messages be? What would that lesson be? So this is one of the uh, things that I notice young people don't have. They typically don't have an answer to what they want. I know this is going to sound strange. The scariest people in the world is somebody that's clear on what they want. When I was single, I thought I knew what I wanted as a woman. So I'd go date, and one time I dated the same kind of girl with three different girls. It's the, I, when I tell you Petro's identical, it's the same exact girl, same exact girl, same exact girl. And one day I sat down and I'm like, oh, you know what, all these girls, you know, the market today doesn't have any good girls and all this other stuff. And, you know, the victim side, oh, they're not out there, right? Sure. And then I sat down one day and I read a book, 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged. And I literally went through every single one of the questions. What I thought I was looking for, I wasn't looking for. What I thought I was looking for was on the outside. What I thought I was looking for that was really important to me and what things were non-negotiable wasn't the three girls I did. And I noticed the trend, okay? So then I came back and I got clear. Four girls I dated afterwards, second date, every one of them. I need you to read this book. I need you to read this book. Really? Second date. My wife today, our second date, went to church, went to the Steps in Santa Monica, went to Earth Cafe, then went to Borders on 3rd Street, and I bought her a book, 101 yeah. Question Less Before You Get Engaged. A week later at her house, six hours, we went through every single question together. And these are tough questions, like what baggage do you bring to the table? Sure. You know, what are some of the stuff on the past? So if a young person's watching this, when I got clear on what I wanted, everything became clear, right? I knew what women I wanted. I know what kind of a business I wanted to build. I know what kind of a friend I wanted to have in my life. I know what kind of people I wanted to mentor me. I realize exactly what's the right kind of a mentor. Like he is a, I call mentors trifectas. I'll explain to you what I mean. The reason why we get a lot of these things to come, we don't go to them. I want you to know this. You don't see me in a lot of different places. I don't do a lot of speaking because we don't accept a lot of speaking ourselves. We get a lot of offers, which is very nice, but we say no to 90% of them. Here's why. I like T, trifecta type of mentors. This is what makes them T. The letter T stands for theory. He has certain theories in life. You meet a lot of people online that are mentors and they read 200 books and now they're theories on how to build a business, but they've never built a business. The E is experience. He has experience building a business, right? So the experience is, there's a big difference between you being a salesperson versus having employees, lease, office, attorneys, lawsuits. It's a very, there's a reason why so many people don't do it. So he's got experience. And last but not least, it's application. He's applied and knows what works and what doesn't work. So my eye got very clear in knowing who to take counsel from, and I wanted to be around trifectas. That's a trifecta. Look for trifecta type of mentors around you because you're not getting gibberish. You're not getting somebody telling you, like 
My friend Bradford sitting back there, his background in the military, special ops, special forces. He wasn't just in the army. Like, I was just in the army. I never went to war. I can't tell you what it is to be into war and seven people dead on him carrying one of them. I can't. He can tell you that. I can't tell you that. That's a T, trifecta. If it's coming to the military, I can't give you stories. He could give you stories. So the moment I went to that and I saw people giving me advice on what to do with my business, I always ask a set of questions and I realized this is a T person. Mm. This is a trifecta person. Perfect. I want to be around trifecta types of people because their counsel is always going to give me the blind spot that most people will miss. A trifecta person won't help you miss it. A trifecta person will say, by the way, these three things I just told you, you could still do it wrong if you don't pay attention to X, Y, Z. That's the trifecta. So those are some of the things I would tell the younger entrepreneur to be thinking about. Brilliant, brilliant. So, so I'm fascinated that you're so into mentorship because I was going to ask you, when is it that you're going to start mentoring? And then, of course, you said when we hit a million subs, we're going to launch this big event, big event. And so I'm, I'm curious, do you plan on creating some kind of a coaching mentoring thing? Because you've got to have people banging down your door saying, hey, mentor me, coach me. I want to experience what you know as an entrepreneur. Yeah, pro and this is probably what I'll say. And, and I don't want it to come across as a, you know, takeaway or an arrogant approach at all. I like speaking to CEOs. I like speaking to people that are building a business that are maybe past phase one. Phase one, people, just go watch Valuetainment and come to a Valuetainment conference. You're going to be inspired to want to go into phase two. But when you're talking to a phase two, phase three CEO, that is where I can give direction more than giving somebody at a phase one. Phase one, there's plenty of contact to help you go from you know, zero to six figures. You don't need a direct uh, uh, relationship to go to six figures today. And, I, and by the way, I didn't grow up with YouTube. You didn't grow up with YouTube. When we were coming up, it was like, you talk, talked about the books. Tom Hopkins led you to, you know, Brian uh, Tracy. Brian Tracy led you to Abram, led you to Kennedy, you know, Kennedy, then Abraham, right? So you went through that part and you read the book. Today, YouTube, you can sit on YouTube today and watch the right videos, the right videos with the right people producing content. You watch it for 90 days. If you don't get to six-figure income, purely you don't have the work ethic. I want to get to the part where I'm going with a guy that's doing 10 million to go to 20, 40, 50, 100 million, that's where I get excited about because the numbers are scalable. And it's typically two, three small things you find to tweak where a guy just goes like this. We had three guys that flew in, okay? One guy, three years ago, he started watching Value Team and he was making 200 grand a year. Last year, $15 million. Mario and I sit in our breakfast, he said, show me the numbers. I'm like, you went from 200 to 50 million, tell me why. So I got onto Value Team and I watched his five videos. I had no idea how to do this. I was not somebody that was sales. I was more the technical guy. I brought somebody that was sales. I brought somebody that was this, and my business grew. So we're probably going to go into that direction, but um, it'll be people that have already built an established business. That's gotcha. the interest. I, I had a feeling that was the direction you're going, and I, and I think that there's a massive vacuum in there for someone just like you, and so I can't wait till you enter there. How do people learn more about you? Uh, yeah, I'm easy to find. Instagram, Patrick Bed David, Twitter, Patrick Bed David, and YouTube. Just type in value, Tim, and you'll find us. I do have one more question before we log off. Your Ferrari video that went viral. Yes. Was that intentional? Is, in, like, did you guys craft that to go viral, or was that just, it went viral? Not at all. So I'll tell you the story about that. So we made the video, and uh, we went on YouTube, and the title was Best Motivational Video, 2015. And it got 2,500 views in the first 24 hours. Oh, nice. We were so disappointed. 2,500 views in the uh, first 24 hours. And then Mario and I are talking, I'm like, Mario, this thing didn't do that good. Mario, Mario, Mario's always like, well, Pat, you got to think about the long term. This is going to do good. We have to be patient. People haven't seen it yet. I think it's doing okay. I'm like, Mario, this thing didn't do good. Yeah, terrible. And so I was with uh, uh, the founder of Lululemon, Chip Wilson. If yeah. you, you, this, I just saw the interview. When it comes out, it's going to be sick when it comes out with Chip Wilson, his new book, Little Black Sketchy Pants. One of the things he said is, he says, uh, create, I asked him, I said, are you ever happy? He says a true creative person is never content with what he's creating. What, the moment they produce a product, they don't like the product. The Truth. moment they, I was blown away by what he said with that, right? Here's a $3.9 billion guy saying from the moment he produced a product, he was never happy with it. It was always like, I have to make you better, make you better, make you better. That's why sometimes it's hard to work with somebody like that, right? So going back to the uh, question with the life, of, uh, the life of an Entrepreneur video. So then I go on Facebook. It's October 31st. It is 3.13 Pacific Standard Time. I'm about to take my kids uh, trick-or-treat, and we're going to go to Northridge Mall, and then we're going to go to some friends and go trick-or-treat, and my dad's sitting right there. I uploaded on uh, Facebook without telling Mario. I said, I'm going to change the title. I watched the video again. It was 90 seconds to the moment of the, uh, the story. So I said, life of an entrepreneur in 90 seconds. 
So I changed the title from Best Motivational Video to Life of an Entrepreneur in 90 Seconds, and I uploaded it. And then I went with my dad, and then all of a sudden I look at my phone on Facebook, my phone is blowing up. It's got a quarter million views. That's a lot of Holy views shit. if you've never had a quarter million right. views. And then all of a sudden I go to sleep. I wake up. Every single website of ours is shut down. Every what PHP, everything is shut down. Because of all the traffic. Every single thing. The amount of emails in 24 hours, I got 25,000 emails. 25,000 emails that we got. That ultimate self-discovery questionnaire on the website was taken 33,000 times. It was taken. 33,000 times that PDF was downloaded. And then obviously it goes 10 million, 20 million, and 31 million views later. Crazy stuff. That's yeah. become a legendary video for it, you. It, it's, it's, uh, it's inspired a lot of people around the world. Yes, but you know, just because you did it once, let me tell you, to do it again, it's, right. not, it's, no. not, uh, uh, it's not like, well, we're going to do it again. This one's going to go viral. There's, there is some luck when it comes down to virality. Ain't that the truth. Mr. Patrick Bed David, thank you so much for spending Absolutely. time with us here at The Empire Show. Really appreciate you. And of course, if you're not following Patrick, please be sure to follow him. Watch Valuetainment. You will be entertained. You will be educated. And you will get a really good glimpse into the history of what makes this man an amazing entrepreneur. Thank you so much for spending time with Thanks us. Thanks for having me, brother. Appreciate thank you. you.